Hey, 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 happy hump day. Pull up a chair, come on in, relax, because it's time for another edition of The Daily Dope. Howdy, 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 gang. Yes, I'm Jeff McAleer, back once again as your host here at The Daily Dope, presented by TheGamingGang.com, of which I happen to be the Grand Pooba. <laughs> Little finger guns there. So welcome aboard. Tonight is Wednesday, January 29th, 2020. This is episode 432 of The Daily Dope. This is the first time you've swung in to check out the show, let me point out. It's very, very casual. It is certainly not rocket surgery by any stretch of the imagination. Just me talking about the latest tabletop gaming news. And sometimes we go off on little tangents, or I should, shouldn't say tangents, I guess we should say little sidetracks with folks in chat. So sometimes we're talking a little bit about uh, pop culture, but for the most part, we're pretty much talking about tabletop gaming. Oh, yes. So if you like the video, be sure to give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel. And if you do, don't forget, ring that little bell because it will notify you not only of when the Daily Dope starts streaming live within about a minute or so. It'll also tell you when I upload standalone videos to the channel as well. And of course, when you're not watching videos on the Gaming Gang channel, be sure to visit thegaminggang.com for all the latest in gaming news, reviews, comics, movies, TV. Get your geek on at thegaminggang.com. And tell a friend, tell two friends. Yes, help spread the word. So I see Dan from No Enemies here has hung, decided to hang out tonight. Good to see you, Dan. Hubcam 210, a gray day. The Madman is in chat. Uh, I thought Wednesday is gaming night for the Madman. Hmm. I know Friday night is. I thought Wednesday night was as well. So already got uh, some uh, chat cooking. Beat Cafe is here as well. Hopping into chat. So hopefully everybody's having a good hump day. It's Wednesday. Mine's all right. I had nothing too exciting going on so far. But anyway, uh, oh, it's every other Wednesday, every other Friday for the Mad Men. Sorry about that. I thought it was uh, two nights a week. I know that's, you know, that, that'd be too much gaming entertainment, correct? In one week. <laughs> so anyway, good to have everybody hanging out. Got a good uh, amount of news tonight. A couple of items that uh, I'm actually really interested in. I'm always interested. I don't, I don't share news for stuff that I'm like, this is crap. I don't do that. I am not that kind of guy. But uh, a couple of Kickstarters, which have actually piqued my interest. I will bring you some news about those as well. But first off, let's jump on in because arriving in March from Ares Games and Galacta Games is the King and Assassins Deluxe Edition. I've got the dope. King and Assassins is an asymmetrical fantasy game of strategy and deception for two players. One player controls a vile king. Damn you, king! And his knightly lackeys, mm -hmm, cronies, eh? Who try to force their way into the castle through a mob of wrathful citizens. The other player controls the mob itself, and more importantly, Three assassins who hide among the crowd, hoping to kill or stop the ruler long enough for the people to deal with him using their bare fists. Take a little of that with ya. <laughs> the king has only so much time before he is overpowered by his own subjects, but using guile and swords of his guards, he may be able to eliminate the assassins and hopefully escape into the safety of his palace. The gameplay is based upon action cards, which show a limited number of action points available to both sides. 
first the king and his knights move around the board securing their position or eliminating dangers pushing aside the crowd. Get out of the way. Then the assassins hidden among the crowd prepare for their lethal strike by killing guards or making the king's progress slower. It's up to the players to make the most of the action points available in the current round. The king's player wins if he manages to escape from the board using one of the exits or if his knights eliminate all the assassins. The assassins win if they kill the king, obviously enough, by dealing him two wounds or if they stall him long enough so that the action card deck is depleted. Choose your strategy. Hide the assassins among 12 beautifully illustrated citizens. I will actually say something about that in a moment. And play two different scenarios, each with a multitude of choices in this simple yet rewarding game. And remember, every familiar face may conceal a sharp blade. So uh, there was mention of uh, the illustrations, which I am sharing some of the illustrations. They look very cool. Do want to point out that this deluxe edition actually will feature 23 plastic miniatures. Not too shabby. Uh, I am sharing an image of the miniatures as well. King and Assassins is for two players, ages 14 and up. Yeah, it's about right, I would think, seeing that the, the subject matter is you're trying to murder a king. Plays in about 20 to 30 minutes. It will carry an MSRP of $39.95 when it arrives in March. Also want to point out, I am sharing an image it just passed by of uh, the previous edition. Uh, and that is because there really isn't any images for this deluxe edition outside the new box, as well as uh, the miniatures, which the picture for the miniatures isn't really that big. But uh, I wanted to share what it looks like because this does sound kind of cool. I gotta admit, sounds like an interesting two-player game. Plus, for a change, you know, one player's playing the king, and he's villainous. He's vile. <laughs> anyway, and 23 minis to be included. And yes, I get it. The vast majority of them are, like, townsfolk miniatures. But, in fair, $39.95, and you get 23 minis, that's kind of a bonus, right? So let's see what's going on in chat. Uh, yeah, so the madman says if uh, they were playing every Wednesday and Friday, the wife would kill him. Uh-huh. So, so, so. Anyway. Uh, yeah, right. So that's why one of the reasons Dan only has a certain window of time that he can watch the show too. Because uh, his girlfriend will kill him if he, uh, he watches for too long. <laughs> All right. So my first Kickstarter... Let's talk a little bit about because uh, there is one week left to back Martin Wallace's latest design. It is Rocket Men. Rocket Men burning on the fuel from Exxon. Bum, bum, bum. Oh. No, that ain't it. Anyway, it is Rocket Men from Phalanx Games. I've got the dope. Here, oh, there we go. I was going to say, where the heck is the, uh, the images there? They have set up their empires of trailblazing innovation and groundbreaking technologies on a somewhat unremarkable planet circling around a rather average star. Years of hard work and steadfast dedication to their clear-cut vision of looking further than the day-to-day -day toils and chores of human civilization have cemented their reputation as the forefathers of the future humanity. Secretly, they have never stopped dreaming about the thrust of all their interests Nurial actions and deeds reaching the stars. Now the time has come for them to embark on a second giant leap for humankind to make the outer reaches of the solar system our home. Only one of them shall go down in history as the first explorer of space and a person who truly forged their will and power according to the bold words Sidious Altius Fortius Faster, higher, stronger. We can rebuild him. It only cost you six million dollars. Immerse yourself in a fast-paced race to the final frontier, space. A deck-building confrontation of swift decision-making and tactical choices, Rocketman gives you the feel of taking a front seat 
in a technologically wonderful spectacle of space exploration. It's up to your predictive abilities and resource management skills to determine what kind of endeavor would be the most suitable for paving the way to Earth's celestial neighbors. It doesn't matter whether it would be a low Earth orbit satellite or a manned base destined for the Red Planet. Plan your mission carefully, equip your shuttles and rockets craftily, yet do not hesitate when your gut instinct tells you when it's time to LAUNCH! The universe might wait for you eternally. Your opponents won't. So there is a quick Kickstarter video. It's a little more than a minute. It's not super long. We'll share it with you. Let's get a closer look at Rocket Men. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, ignition. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, launch. National space programs allowed humanity to get to the Earth's orbit and further to the moon. But reaching Mars seems to be beyond their ability. The new era of space conquest will belong to the new empires, those of groundbreaking innovations and technology. To the daring entrepreneurs, rocket men, you. In order to fulfill the dream of space exploration, one needs the know-how and industrial power base. Those will be mustered on Earth to launch a mission that will cross the frontiers and open the universe to the rest of mankind. Discover Martin Wallace's deck-building game of future space exploration race for one to four players. Rocket Men, just launched at Kickstarter. Rocket Men is for one to four players, ages 14 and up, plays in 30 to 90 minutes. The project is over 200% funded. You can reserve a copy of the game as well as Kickstarter goodies for a $30 pledge through February 5th. Expected delivery is this October. There are a few other pledge levels that include uh, like miniatures and things like that, but you can get the core game for a $30 pledge. Personally, from what I'm looking at, what I'm seeing, this looks very interesting, and I know we have a few people in chat who are also saying, ah, I've been keeping an eye out on this. It does look pretty interesting. <clears throat> it is a Martin Wallace design, so we know it'll be unique. There's always going to be this one little aspect of Martin Wallace designs where you sit there and you go, huh? Eh. It's just a, hmm, <laughs> just how Martin Wallace designs tend to be. But this looks pretty cool. And uh, Phalanx makes good stuff. They make good games. So I would take a guess that, of course, this is already 200% funded, over 200%. So we will see this. This will be a game that we will find down the line, Ares Games releases here in North America. But maybe don't want to wait too long. Get your hands on Rocket, excuse me, Rocket Men. All right, so Kabuki Kid is in chat. Good to see you, Double K. Yes, Dan from No Enemies here is harassing Double K about going to WPC. I swear, I think Dan actually owns stock in that show. It's gotta be, it's gotta be it. Oh, uh, and sorry to hear, Double K is uh, taking care of someone who is ill so uh sorry to hear that so anywho moving right along <clears throat> let me grab a quick sip here once again it's, you know it's kind of chilly down here in the duct tape studios tonight and very dry as always no, no. anyway moving right along it is a wednesday i like to talk a little bit about war games all the time I don't run across a whole lot of really interesting wargaming news every day. But I also do like war games that are miniatures games. So let's talk a little bit about Warlord games. They've got a new release. It's uh, available for pre-order right now for their Cruel Seas miniatures game, which is actually small scale World War II naval. Oh, I shouldn't say small scale. I should say it's uh, mainly auxiliaries. You're not looking at, you know, 
battleships and carriers and things like that. You are talking about, um, like, coastal patrol boats. Anyway, here's the dope on close quarters. While gigantic warships stalk the open oceans, engaging enemies over the horizon with their titanic weapons, much smaller craft hug the coastal waters, protecting the land against raids and invasion. Such naval combat was often quick, brutal, and decisive. Brave sailors gunned the engines of their smaller, less well-protected boats in order to rapidly close within sight of the enemy and engage them with machine guns, auto cannons, and torpedoes, rigging the enemy boats with bullets or lighting the night sky with explosions. With such visceral close quarter fighting, many crews fought and died on the waves of the unforgiving, cruel seas. This supplement includes 11 new historic scenarios spanning the seas of this global conflict, as well as a random scenario generator. Also included are expanded ship rosters for the seafaring nations and new rosters for the Finnish Navy and Yugoslav partisan fleet. New rules for amphibious invasions and experimental Q-ships are presented as well as expanded rules for aircraft and submarines. I even think there's rules in here for like buzz bombs. I think I ran across something. It was like buzz bomb rules. I was like, oh, okay. These new additions to your games of Cruel Seas will help you turn the tide of battle. Close Quarters is a supplement for Cruel Seas, the 1-300th scale tabletop war game of World War II naval battles. A copy of the Cruel Seas rulebook is needed to use this supplement. The 68-page supplement is slated for a late February release and will carry an MSRP of, wait for it, $32. Ouch. I'm sorry. Sorry, Warlord Games. I know you guys usually have some pretty good prices on stuff, but 68-page softcover supplement for $32 is outrageous. It really is. have to say that. Uh, although, I got to point out, it, wasn't it just recently? Wasn't it this week or last week that Warlord raised the prices on pretty much everything? Because um, I think it's their manufacturer and that kind of started raising the prices on them. So, of course, they had to pass that on to the consumer. So, uh, anyway, does seem like a cool system. I love the miniatures. The miniatures look very, very cool. They are fairly large scale at 1 300th scale for ships. So, I mean, the miniatures should be pretty good size. Uh, I am a big naval warfare fan. Uh, love naval games. And, of course, I mention it all the time. I, uh, every once in a while, haven't gotten to play in a while. Uh, every once in a while, we do play Fletcher Pratt's naval war game. <laughs> yes. All right, so uh, so Dan from No Enemies here is asking, who owns Ares? Uh, yeah, I believe they are their own company. They are not part of, like, Asmodee or anything like that. So, uh, A Gray Day says, yes, Warlord Games did raise their prices. Uh, yeah, that's what I thought. I thought I ran across something, and the prices, the hike was, it's not on everything, I don't think. But it was kind of substantial. It was like five bucks on most of their like boxes and that. So, Junk new. All right, moving right along. Let's talk a little bit about role playing games because you know I love my RPGs. And this is the second Kickstarter we're talking about tonight because Frog God Games has a new box set for the old school revival. I like to say old school renaissance because I'm fancy that way. But I know a lot of people like to say old school revival swords and wizardry. It is a new box set. It is a limited edition. There's also a collector's edition box set. It is up for crowdfunding on Kickstarter. Here's the dope. After more than 10 years of requests, we're finally producing a box set for these swords and wizardry rules. The original ancestor of 5e. I don't know about that. We'll talk about that in a sec. It's a fast-playing, wild ride into the world of the fantastic with the same depth of play as its later edition brethren. 
a fantasy role-playing game with a distinct feel to it, different from later editions of the game, and now it comes in a box. Swords and Wizardry is more than a restatement of the original rules that gave rise to 5e. It is fast playing, easy to start, and easy to learn by anyone. Swords and Wizardry is a snapshot of the rules as they existed in 1978, right before first edition, because it's in quotes, was released. The fifth edition game currently played, watched, and beloved by millions is great fun, but the structure of the rules has changed over the course of editions, and there's a unique feel to the earlier versions of the game, which you may not have encountered before. The rules in Swords and Wizardry are based on the original 1974 game, plus all the supplements released from 1974 to 78, articles in the Strategic Review and the Dragon Magazine from that period, plus tips for house rule choices. The rules are organized in a more modern fashion than the original books, thank God. And more, that, that's my, me throw that in, thank God. And more accessible to those who started gaming after the 1970s. These original rules are considered different than the 5e version you may be familiar with. Yeah, a lot different. Here's a quick rundown of how the feel of the game can be very different. Character generation is very fast and contains less detail and fewer choices to make about specific skills or tailored options. Combat moves along quickly and tactics are based on what the player describes doing rather than on anything listed on a character sheet. In general, the lighter approach of these rules leads to certain effects on gameplay. Since combat occupies less time, there's often more focus on exploration and puzzle solving than there is in later editions of the game. You don't have to reserve time for long combats. Since there are no established rules for noticing things, figuring out how mechanisms work, or interpreting language, there's more scope for presenting puzzles as tests of skill for the players. Player problem solving is more direct in earlier editions of the game. Role-playing is just as robust as in later editions of the game. I get really tired how they just keep saying, the game. Don't it emerges from the players and the way a particular gaming group operates. Swords and Wizardry is about rulings, not rules. That's kind of an OSR thing right there. And a lot of players describe a test of whether it's working well when the referee describes the situation and the players don't immediately look down at their character sheets for their options. That's when they're in the original D and D zone, which uh, a little side note you may not realize that was actually the last show that Rod Serling was on after Night Gallery. Bet you didn't know that. All right, so here we go. We've got a video from Frog God Games. It's a little more than three minutes, so uh, kick back, relax, and let's learn a little bit more about this new box edition of Swords and Wizardry. Welcome back, fellow adventurers, to Frog God Games. And today we are launching our limited edition Swords and Wizardry box set Kickstarter. Swords and Wizardry is a fun and quick alternative to other role-playing games. We are very excited to bring it to you in a new format, which is the old school box sets. But instead of listening to me go on and on about the Kickstarter and Swords and Wizardry itself, I thought I'd reach out to a couple members in the community to get some first-hand experiences with Swords and Wizardry. Thank you very much for checking out our Kickstarter. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to leave them in the comments or reach out to us on any of our social medias. Thank you for your consideration. And now check out some first-hand experiences from members of our community. So why do I love Swords and Wizardry? Well, I've been playing fantasy role-playing games since 1981, and my best memories have always been from the earliest games that I've played. Um, up until recently, of course, I started playing Swords and Wizardry about five years ago. And I knew for a long time that something was missing from role-playing games for me. And what it was, I found out, was that sense of awe and, and wonder, the excitement of playing a, a role-playing game. Uh, that's what I had been missing, and that's what I found with uh, Swords and Wizardry. Not so much worrying about how the game is played, but how fun it is to play the game. That's what's really important. And that is why I love Swords and Wizardry. You don't get all lost in the numbers and having to figure out 
how many points you hit somebody for because basically the system is based on a six-sided and a 20-sided dice. And because of that, you have a lot more time to play your character and actually role play it instead of spending time trying to figure out what your numbers come up to. Another thing I love about it is a lot of times the adventures are more of figuring out puzzles, where you need to go, what you need to get. It's not a matter of just zerging through a dungeon and hacking slash and killing everything that's in your way. Another cool thing that Frog God Games has done is that they have created a dungeon called Mithras Tower, which they run at many of the cons throughout the country every year. If you have a character that was created in one of these games, you can use it from con to con and grow your character and have it progress many levels. It's actually really cool because there's a bunch of us that follow many of the cons and we get together and we game and we get to continue our, our travels together as a group, which has created a lot of wonderful friendships along the way. So if you're looking for a new game to try, something that doesn't take a lot of work and get you into a game right way, right away, I would highly recommend trying Swords and Wizardry. It, it really is a great game and I hope you'll enjoy it. Hey everybody, Laramie Wall here. I was asked why I love Swords and Wizardry, and I've got two really great reasons for you. Reason number one, minutes. Reason number two, years. I think you can see I really love gaming. Here's your two reasons. Minutes. These rules, you can teach any one of your friends to play this game literally in minutes. It's faster than Monopoly. Reason number two, years. One little rule book, you guys can have fun for years. This is all you need. And that is why I love swords and wizardry. The Kickstarter project is over 400% funded. You can reserve a copy of the limited edition for a $50 pledge or the limited edition box for a $55 pledge through March 4th. Expected delivery is this October. So pretty good quick turnaround on this gotta point out that video is weird <laughs> i'm like did, did that end for i mean first of all it ends like like that i mean i i downloaded that from the kickstarter site so uh it ends like what huh it's over what and uh the last person that they show i don't know he's not incenting me me to back this project <laughs> that said swords and wizardry is actually really good <laughs> i this is just a weirdly presented kickstarter uh and you know i'm sure you know frog god games knows what they're doing uh and obviously this is going to get produced it's just the the way the phrasing is for the information they keep talking about 5e 5e and the game the game uh never once actually talking about dungeons and dragons so uh or the world's uh oldest role-playing game or whatever you know the that terminology that uh the companies like to use the world's greatest role-playing game is another one that people throw out there as well so uh so it says that was what happens when you live in Paulsbo, Washington. Uh, I have actually been there, amazingly enough. Uh, Dan from No Enemies Here has to rock out. So we've replaced Dan with uh, Kevin Thorpe. I noticed Kevin popped into chat while that video was going as well. Good to see you, Dan. Catch you later. Uh, yes, I have been to Paul's Bro. Paul's Bo. Isn't it Paul's Bro? I guess it is Paul's Bo. Oh, yeah, near uh, Seattle. So yes, when I used to deliver RVs around the country, I used to deliver um, RVs from Indiana to Seattle. Well, I delivered them all over the place, but there was there was a place, uh, there was a chain of uh, RV stores in Washington, and it was Paul's Paul's Bow or whatever. All right, anywho, uh, this kind of throws me off a little bit. So in reality. Uh, and somebody correct me if I'm wrong, because I have read through quite a few different um, retro clones over the years. And if I remember correctly, I thought Swords in Wizardry is more a kind of a retro clone of 
original D and D, original like box D and D, uh, where uh, cla- uh, races, class, things like that. I mean, I know it's been expanded out, made much easier to understand, and things like that. Uh, that's why I find it kind of strange because it's, it's almost kind of like a, it's got a little like B slash X to it as well, but it's, it really doesn't have a lot of inspiration from say first through fifth edition, which funny enough, I always call first edition a D and D that's because what, that's what it was advanced Dungeons and dragons. I don't, I never refer to it as first edition, strangely enough. But anyway, this looks like it's a, a really cool deal. Uh, Swords and Wizardry is very popular. There's always a lot of adventures that come out for Swords and Wizardry. And if you think about it, $50 for a box set of four soft cover books, pretty nice deal. I think they're kind of jumping on this because so many people have been uh, picking up the old school essentials set, which is supposed to be pretty cool. It's supposed to be pretty cool. All right, so... Um, so Kabuki Kid says, yeah, I that they always look at Swords and Wizardry as a retro clone for OD and D. But a gray day says plays like first E, but mechanics are closer to 3E. Really? Huh. Okay. So uh yes, Labyrinth Lord is more first edition. Uh see, I'm one of these people where I just like I want to just kit bash stuff, is what I do with my role playing. Even Call of Cthulhu, I, there are certain aspects of Call of Cthulhu that I've, I've thrown the, those rules out years ago and replaced them with my own. All right, so do want to uh, mention I'm going to move on to my last news piece. It's going to be a bit longer. It is uh, the Paizo news. I got uh, the info about what's coming out in May. But before I jump into that, I do want to remind you that uh, this Friday is going to mark the uh, last day that uh, you can use the special promo code from Paizo, their holiday code, to receive 10% off any order. That holiday code is one word, HOLIDAY20. If I remember right, I think it's all lowercase. Almost positive. So do want to mention that uh, this Friday will be the last day that you can utilize that to uh, save 10%. So sweet. So that's kind of cool. Paizo gave everybody a 10% uh, promo code that they could use. So Kevin Thorpe says, yeah, there's a lot of OSR out there. There is a lot of OSR, and there are a lot of flavors of OSR out there, too. So as a large community, yeah, it is. It can be kind of an oddball community. Uh, I, uh, I Maybe I'll get into it a little bit after we finish up the Paizo news. Uh, if, if, if the mood takes me, I guess. So I don't want to get off on a tangent before I... Do the Paizo news. Anyway, so as I mentioned, Paizo has announced their May releases for both Pathfinder and Starfinder. And, of course, I've got the Dell. Ah, damn it. I knew I was going to hit the wrong button there when I jumped to uh, the full shot of me. <laughs> oh, duh. All right, there we go. Tonight's been a weird night. The show actually opened up weird just as I was, as I was about to, like, start doing my, doing my, uh, hey, 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 happy Wednesday. <laughs> Something that was hanging up here, all of a sudden it just fell, and I saw it, I was like, just as I was going live, and it threw me off, and I'm like, uh, 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 uh. Anyway, first off, we've got Pathfinder Lost Omens, Absalom, City of Lost Omens. This is the the kind of big release for me. For nearly 5,000 years, the great city of Absalom has stood at the center of the inner seas, culture, commerce, and prophecy. Now, with the death of the city's founder god, Eredin, the disappearance of the city's lord mayor, and newly launched attacks from some of its greatest foes, Absalom stands at the gateway to a new and uncertain destiny. This lore-packed 296-page hardcover guide to the locations, denizens, and adventures of Pathfinder's most famous city is the largest Pathfinder city source book to date, presenting a fascinating locale suitable for years of adventure. A huge eight-panel poster map of the city 
sets the scene in unprecedented detail, allowing your heroes to walk upon streets paved with centuries of history. Following the steps of generations of questing heroes, that chart a new path for the city at the center of the world. This will carry an MSRP of $46.99. Then we have the Pathfinder Adventure Path number 155, Lord of the Black Sands, which is part five of six in the Extinction Curse Adventure Path. On the hunt for a life-giving an orb far below the surface world, the heroes venture into a blighted Darklands waste known as the Vault of the Black Desert. Spoilers! Facing off against lurking vampire-like Underhav and even stranger subterranean beasts, the heroes track the lost artifact to an enclave of undead dark elves in the twisted city at the vault's blackened heart, where they must confront the malevolent mummy who strives to become the desert's eternal sovereign. Hmm, Mask of the Mummy, huh? Mummy's Curse? Is it a Mask of the Mummy's Curse? Seems to seem to ring a bell as far as an adventure path for first edition Pathfinder. Anywho, Lord of the Black Sands is a Pathfinder adventure for four 15th level characters. This adventure continues the Extinction Curse Adventure Path, a six part monthly campaign in which the heroes lead a traveling circus as they unravel a plot to eradicate all life from the islands of the inner sea. This volume also includes a gazetteer of the ominous city of Sharing new monsters, and new rules. Each monthly full-color softcover Pathfinder Adventure Path volume, said that five times fast, contains an in-depth adventure scenario, stats for several new monsters, and support articles meant to give game masters additional material to expand their campaign. Pathfinder Adventure Path volumes use the open game license and work with both the Pathfinder RPG and the world's oldest fantasy role-playing game. Hmm, what could that be, right? We were just talking about that. This will carry an MSRP of $24.99. It is a soft cover book. Also, we've got the Pathfinder Adventure Path Curse of the Crimson Throne Pocket Edition. The kings and queens of Corvosa have long ruled under the shadow of the Curse of the Crimson Throne, an infamous superstition claiming that no monarch of the city of Corvosa shall ever die of old age or produce an heir. Whether or not there is any truth to the legend of the curse, Carvolt says, current king is but the latest victim to succumb to this foul legacy. Now the metropolis teeters on the edge of anarchy. Anarchy! And it falls to a band of new heroes to save Carvolt from the greatest threat it has ever known. I don't know, there's just something about that name where it's like Carvolt I know it's probably just Corvosa. This soft cover compilation presents the fan favorite campaign for use with the Pathfinder role playing game first edition, including new and revised content and nearly 500 pages packed with mayhem, excitement, and adventure. The Curse of the Crimson Throne Pocket Edition contains all six chapters of the original Adventure Path, expanded and updated for use with the Pathfinder role playing game first edition an in-depth gazetteer of the city of Corvosa, as it exists under the rule of its new queen, an array of new rules options for characters ranging from campaign traits to spells to magic items, an expansive appendix with statistics, descriptions, backgrounds, and rule support for the 12 most important NPCs in the campaign. There's a bestiary featuring nine monsters from the original adventure path, dozens of new illustrations, never before seen characters, location maps, extensive new encounter locations, and more, all for the low, low, low MSRP of $29.99. That is a smoking deal. <clears throat> Pocket editions of the Pathfinder stuff is always really nicely priced. Ah, moving right along, let's talk more about second edition again, because there's also the Pathfinder Game Master Guide NPC Pawn Collection. The spotlight isn't always on heroes or monsters. Some encounters call for a whole cast of non-player characters, and the Pathfinder Game Mastery Guide NPC Pawn Collection is the best way to bring the most useful and common encountered NPCs to your gaming table. 
This value-packed collection contains every NPC presented in the Pathfinder Game Mastery Guide and is perfect for use with the Pathfinder role-playing game, obviously enough, or any fantasy RPG. NPCs include beggars, guards, judges, jailers, pirates, a cult leader, and cultists, innkeepers, executioners, surgeons, bandits, torchbearers, acrobats, and more. Printed on sturdy cardstock, each pawn slots into a size-appropriate plastic base from the Pathfinder Pawn's base assortment, making them easy to mix with traditional metal or plastic miniatures. The Pathfinder Game Master Guide NPC Pawn Collection is the best way to ensure you've got the perfect character for every Pathfinder role-playing game encounter. This box will carry an MSRP of $25.99. And the final major Paizo release. There's other stuff out there that's hitting in May. There's some decks of cards. There are flip mats. A lot of goodies. I just figured I'm going to stick with the major stuff on the show. If you check out the news post tomorrow, because I think most of you realize that I do the news at night and then the news items, the articles go up on the website the following morning. I will have everything listed, including the flip maps and things like that. But we also get the Starfinder Adventure Path number 28, the Hollow Cabal. It is part four of six in the Threefold Conspiracy Adventure Path. After discovering that a sinister force has infiltrated the stewards, the heroes travel to the floating bubble city of Roselight. Interesting name. In the clouds of the gas giant, Lavara to warn members of the law enforcement agency. As the heroes navigate the city underbelly of this pristine metropolis, they learn that their enemies are fighting a battle of their own against the malevolent faction of mind-controlling aliens. Damn you, mind-controlling aliens. If the heroes want answers, they will have to figure out who to trust in a time where no one is what they seem. The Hollow Cabal is a Starfinder role-playing game adventure for four 7th level characters. This adventure continues the threefold conspiracy adventure path, a six-part monthly campaign in which the players unravel the machinations of insidious aliens who have infiltrated galactic society. This volume also includes a gazetteer of the affluent city of Roselight and the grungy space station Upwell, an article describing the mysterious fungal Diskopians. I know I didn't pronounce that right. And a selection of new and cryptic monsters. Each full color monthly soft cover Starfinder Adventure Path volume, say that five times fast, contains a new installment of a series of interconnected science fantasy quests that together create a fully developed plot of sweeping scale and epic challenges. Each 64 page volume of the Starfinder Adventure Path also contains and in-depth articles that detail and expand the Starfinder campaign setting and provide new rules, a host of exciting new monsters and alien races, a new planet to explore, and Starship to pilot, and more. This will carry an MSRP of $22.99. Once again, this is also a soft cover. Oh, whew, boy. Tell you, that is a lot of news. All right, so uh, taking a quick peek at chat. So great, he says, yeah, Jeff, I know what you're talking about as far as OSR. Uh, so Kim Thorpe says, uh, I play Pathfinder. Maybe I'll drop hints to our GM. <laughs> so and a great, he says, yeah, my eyes can't do pocket edition. No, well, I've got new bifocal contacts. So uh, pretty interesting. My close-up vision is actually... I, I don't have to wear reading glasses or anything like that. My distance vision, not as good as they were with my old contacts. Ah, Kevin Thorpe says they're starting a traveler campaign in March. Glowing Turtle popped into chat. Good to see you, Turtle. Welcome aboard. So, the Madman says that uh, he's been running a 5e group and a Swords and Wizardry group. Running ETU... Oh, I'm sorry, Savage Worlds, not Swords and Wizardry. Savage Worlds, that's right. I forgot. The Madman plays uh, Savage Worlds. So running ETU for the Savage Worlds group. So nice. Um, anyway, so uh, yeah, we got a few minutes. 
So let's talk a little bit about OSR. Real quick. So um, there is, see, I, you know, and I like, I like OSR. I like the old school revival or renaissance. I like to say renaissance. Because that's what I grew up with. Those are the kind of rules I grew up with. And I like the fact, and it's it's kind of funny because the Swords and Wizardry sell sheet info for that Kickstarter actually mentioned that one way that you can tell that the game is working is when the players aren't constantly looking down at their character sheet to figure out what they can do. So I noticed that a lot in uh, most modern role-playing games is everybody's always looking at the character sheet like, ah, ah, what do I do here? What do I do here? Well, the answers aren't necessarily on the character sheet. The answers are up here. <laughs> Not God would, right? But um, there is a, I don't want to say it's a misconception because it does exist. There are some extreme right-wing elements to some old-school renaissance. Um, just like I've got Chalt, which I kept jokingly referring to it as Chalt, which is from Venger Satanis. And I have already gotten emails from people asking how dare I review that, um, which has kind of been like, no, nah, I don't want to say scaring me off of reviewing it, but it's taken a little bit of the wind out of my sails. I will get the, the review up. I'm, I'm hoping to do stuff this weekend because I'll finally have some time. But uh, yeah, there are some sexist elements. Uh, and I don't know if it's because a lot of the old school Renaissance like gamers tend to be older. So they're not as like, woke. Don't, I don't care for that term either. Uh, so, you know, I don't know. Uh, so the way I look at it is, I mean, I think people watch this show, they watch my videos and that, they know I, politically, I'm pretty left of center on most things, uh, especially socially. I'm, I'm very liberal as far as uh, social issues and that. But then again, I am also of the age where I don't, I don't come from this like cancel culture that we've got now where it's like, well, if you don't 100% agree with everything I think, then I want nothing to do with you. I don't worry about that that much. I mean, as long as somebody is not like, you know, a lawbreaker, they're not murdering kittens on the internet, things like that. They don't say horrible things to women or different groups. Then, you know, I'm willing to be like, okay, well, you, you can be, I don't want to say alt-right because no, I don't, I don't think some of these people are exactly alt-right, but um, yeah, I, yeah, I just come from, from an age where everybody could agree to disagree and it was not like, well, it brought everything to a screeching halt. So, I mean, just imagine if you went to a gaming convention and you weren't going to sit down and play anything unless everybody thought about everything the same way as you do you'd be sitting there with a thumb up your ass you wouldn't be playing anything so anyway so glowing turtle mentions osr is great it's the inspiration for the drifter which i still have not gotten a chance to really take a take a look at and i do notice it keeps getting updated on um drive through rpg uh osr isn't political anything goes and doesn't tend to focus on balance correct that is, there's a lot of different stuff out there. But as I mentioned, there is a conception from a lot of people, a lot of people who are newer to the hobby, because when they, they've encountered people that have been unlike them politically, I guess we'll say, uh, when they've kind of tried to dip their toe into OSR. But the thing is, that's not necessarily the case, right? I mean, it's like, it's like anything else. You know, you got a few bad apples and all of a sudden it's like they taint, you know, something. So, I mean, just like, you know, look at 5th edition, look at 5e, look at, you know, the critical role, you know, fandom in that. There's a lot of people out there who are like just way, way, way too 
into themselves. You know, it's sort of like, hey, sorry, I don't, I don't agree with you on whatever. And it's like, like, sorry, whatever. Uh, go knock yourself out. Anyway, all right. Uh, Taxidermic Owlbear is a great list uh, of all OSR and retro clones. Yeah, there is a list online, Grade A. I forget where I ran into it. And it was kind of cool because it was like, so here are all the different games that these retro clones are inspired by or where they draw from. So like, for an example, uh, OSR Essentials is really just, you know, the rules rewritten. I mean, it's, it's really not bringing anything completely new to the hobby, but just the way it's presented, it's very well, very well presented and uh, very easy to understand. All right, so that is it for tonight's show. As I like to always point out, if you dig the show, please give it a thumbs up, fight those trolls out there. And of course, subscribe to the channel. If you do subscribe, don't forget, ring that little bell because it will not only notify you of when the Daily Dope goes live, I'll also tell you when I upload standalone videos as well. And of course, when you're not watching videos on the Gaming Gang channel, be sure to visit thegaminggang.com for all the latest in gaming news, reviews, comics, movies, TV. Get your geek on at thegaminggang.com. Good chat tonight, gang. We had a, a lot of folks in chat. Good deal. Always, uh, always like to uh, have people keeping me company so I don't feel like a complete doofus uh, talking to a camera. But, uh, and of course... I appreciate anybody who watches after the fact as well, even if you're watching on Memorex. So I will be back tomorrow. It'll be Thursday. So everybody enjoy your Wednesday night. And until I see you next, happy trails. Oh, you're still here. Well, if that's the case, by all means, subscribe to the Gaming Gang channel by clicking right here. And of course, if you want to catch up on past episodes of The Daily Dope, check out this playlist. And if you'd like to see what YouTube's recommending you take a peek at from the channel, just give a click right over here. Of course, I'm Jeff McAleer. And once again, thank you very much for watching. <laughs>